tell us about infrastructure investment, um, or the need for investing in infrastructure to get to our fossil launch list. Is that it? Yeah, that's it. Okay, so we're curious. Thank you. Not too far from here, in Promontory, Utah, back in 1869, as the last spike was hammered into the Transcontinental Railroad, the blows were heard across the country. Telegraph wires wrapped around the spike in the sledgehammer transmitted the impact instantaneously east and west. In San Francisco and New York, wires were connected to cannons facing outwards across the ocean. When the signal from the spike came through, the cannons fired. The world was put on notice. The Transcontinental Railroad was completed and America was moving to the forefront of the world stage. Let us pause for a moment to consider the events leading up to that historic occasion. And even before the day Abraham Lincoln signed the Pacific Railway Act into law. During the many decades before the railroad was completed, people either traveled across the country in covered wagons, or they took the long way around, traveling by sea. In that era, the idea of undertaking the task of building a 3,000 kilometer long railway line through the Rockies was an outlandish suggestion. A proposal to design a new kind of covered super wagon would probably have been better received by the majority of investors. Now this represents the evolutionary stage that we're at today with space launch. We don't yet have any infrastructure that makes a journey to space fundamentally safer, more affordable, more convenient, and more, and more sustainable. But the idea of shifting our focus from chemical rockets to infrastructure still seems somewhat outlandish. So how can we be as objective as possible on the topic of when we should start prioritizing infrastructure investment? To answer this question, I propose that we could break the problem down into three main parts. First, estimating the market growth and the anticipated demand. In other words, we need to estimate the position of the dotted purple line on this graph versus time. Second, determine the cost profile associated with chemical rocket based launch systems. This would be the blue line, which shows mass launch versus money spent. And three, select and study an infrastructure based concept. That would be, you know, what is the least outlandish of all the possible outlandish ideas. And we need to determine its cost versus time profile. This will give us the orange line on the graph. If we can properly estimate these three lines, we can make an informed decision. When the purple line gets above the point where the blue and orange curves intersect, then the infrastructure approach makes the most economic sense. Since we're analyzing the value of infrastructure, it is appropriate to consider long-term trends. And one approach we can take is to estimate the current size of the space market and then simply multiply it by a factor that accounts for the growth of the world economy. And the world economy is often associated with the population of the planet, but it's actually far more complicated than that. There's also the increasing human lifespan over time to consider. And on top of that, the increasing productivity each person has. This is due to productivity multipliers or technology. For example, artificial lighting and eyeglasses increase productivity. Then came things like libraries, the internet, computer-aided design, artificial intelligence, and robotics. Another factor we need to consider is what I call societal uplift. That is that initially only a few countries are at the peak of technological achievement, but gradually more and more countries uh, advance to the point where they can contribute to the world economy significantly. And finally, there's networking effects. This is where the more people or more nodes you add to a network, the more you get out of it. But the amount you get out is not proportional, it's proportional to the square of the number of nodes you put in. So the value of the network increases with the square of the number of nodes in the network. Now another approach we can take is to consider, for example, how Mars land area compares to the land area of Earth. This can give us an indication of how much Mar the Mars economy might one day contribute to the solar system's economy. The assumption here is that we'll see a repeat of what happened on Earth, where people from old world continents, such as Asia and Europe, explored, 
settled, and developed the New World continents, such as the Americas and Australia. Today, Earth's economy is 96.5 trillion US dollars per year. Based on land area, Mars would be generating 27 trillion US dollars a year if it was as productive as Earth is today. But of course, Mars has zero productivity today. Well, let's start by looking at human civilization's economy. From the top left figure, we can see that historically there has been a steady exponential growth. Let's extend that out to the year 2100. Now, if we consider just Mars, for example, we need to make some assumptions about when its economy will get started and how long it will take to catch up to Earth on a productivity per square mile or per square kilometer land area basis. With these assumptions, we can extend the curve out to 2100. For example, let's assume that, optimistically that Mars gets started in 2035 and that it takes 65 years for its productivity to catch up to Earth's. Now, I'm not trying to promote the idea here that we're, we're going to land on Mars in 2035 or that it's going to take 65 years for Mars to catch up to Earth in terms of productivity on a square kilometer basis. The point here is just to illustrate that if you pick those two parameters to your satisfaction, we're going to get a curve that allows us to anticipate a future value associated with this colony on Mars. The amount of launch that will need to maintain supply chains between Earth and Mars is likely to be closely related to the size of the Mars economy. Obviously, assumptions will vary, but with these assumptions, Mars' economy will already be 6.5 trillion per year by 2050. So it's easy to see that there is a significant source of future revenue out there, easy enough to service the debt on a capital-intensive infrastructure project. Now, obviously, it could be less or it could be more. The assumption that you make regarding when Mars will get started and how long it will take to catch up depends on your level of optimism and a, and a number of qualitative factors. For example, in the paper I discuss how already people spend 95% of their time indoors or inside a vehicle today, and how people might be able to live as comfortably on Mars as they do on Earth. I also make a point about how infrastructure on Mars, such as roads and bridges, will require less maintenance than their equivalents on Earth. Okay, let's switch now to talking about the progress that we're making with our chemical rocket-based approach to launch. I think Congressman Bill Foster recently summed it up quite nicely in a hearing of the House Committee on Science, Space, and Technology. You're, you're talking about, um, uh, you know, essentially a program based on chemical rockets that would be completely understandable to Werner von Braun. And is, is that something that bothers you, or have you considered moving the needle on that so that actually we have a chance 50 or 100 years from now with having space be affordable to people, which I think is pretty clearly not going to happen when, if we just keep using chemical rockets again and again? Uh, that's a, an important question. Uh, you're, you're absolutely right. Chemical rockets are, are expensive. Um, we're making really great advancements right now on the reusability of rockets, which is driving down cost and increasing that, That's not a major effect. You know, I, I visited SpaceX, uh, you know, when they were, this was still conceptual, hadn't been proven yet, and I asked the question, okay, you, if you reuse the booster, um, you know, how much, you know, let's say it all works and that they're able to do it, um, you know, you reduce your capacity to low Earth orbit because you have to retain fuel to land the booster. You have to go and take stuff apart, re-space, qualify, and everything. How much money do you actually save? And the answer from the engineer at the time was you save 17%. That is not transformative. We need a factor of 10 in the reduction of cost, not, you know, whatever number you get from reusability of the first stage booster. So you, you have to spend money on transformative technologies, and I don't see that anywhere in your budget. Bill Foster, by the way, is the congressman for the 11th District of Illinois, and he's also the only congressperson with a PhD in physics. So let's start where everyone likes to start on this, with the space shuttle program. A common technique used here is to divide the total cost of the space shuttle program by the number of launches and the payload per launch to the ISS. But this doesn't provide us with a sense of how costs evolved over time. A better technique is to plot the payload delivered versus the money spent on the program after correcting for inflation. Now, if you fit a line to that curve, the inverse slope of the fitted line is the cost per kilogram. 
Here the yellow curve shows how the cost per kilogram varied over time for the space shuttle program. Keep in mind that this is a curve for the reference mission that's delivering payloads to the ISS, not just delivering payloads to a minimal LEO orbit. These two jumps in price were unfortunately due to the Challenger and Columbia tragedies. Between those unfortunate events, the cost of resupplying the ISS dropped as low as $59,000 per kilogram. In 2012, NASA published a technology roadmap where they listed three main objectives for the agency. Under each objective, the top technical challenge was the same. Improve access to space, dramatically reduce the total cost, and increase reliability and safety of access to space. It's interesting to note that they chose to say total cost here as opposed to just cost. This implies to me that they want to make sure that the policy focus is on the fully considered cost of launching people and payloads into space. Further on in the report, they say, even in light of major monetary investments in launch over the last several decades, the cost of launch has not decreased and in fact continues to increase. Around the same time, Elon Musk and Glenn Shotwell made some aspirational statements about the future cost of launch with Falcon 9, which I placed on the graph at the bottom. After the space shuttle was retired, NASA implemented a commercial resupply strategy. Since cost and payload manifest data for commercial resupply contracts is publicly available, we can work out the per kilogram cost of this approach the same way we did with the space shuttle program. The blue line here is the cost over all suppliers. The purple line is the cost just for SpaceX. As you can see, initially the cost per kilogram started out quite high and has come down over time. I was able to find some corroborating data, including a forecast made by the Office of the Inspector General, a statement by Robin Gattens, Director of the International Space Station at NASA, and a press release from NASA. These data points show that the costs have stopped coming down and have, in fact, leveled off. Finally, Elon Musk gave an update on Starship on February 10th, 2022, where he said that launch costs would be 100 US dollars per kilogram by 2025. If you are interested in doing your own independent assessment on what the cost per kilogram will be with Starship, I'd encourage you to watch a presentation that I gave earlier this year at the International Space Development Conference. In that presentation, I discussed some of the main differences between Starship and Falcon 9. You can find this presentation on YouTube by searching for the relentless march towards space launch infrastructure and where it might ultimately lead us. One thing that I would like to highlight here is the magnitude of this discrepancy, since it's difficult to see on the graph. The highest data points on this chart are 868 times more costly than the lowest values. Now to create this chart, I did my best to use original ground truth sources of data. If you go on the internet, you'll find all kinds of data, and most of it falls somewhere between these two extremes. There are a few reasons for this. One reason is that in this chart, we are attempting to use a common reference mission. That is the mission of maintaining a supply line to the ISS. Other data sources will sometimes cite a lower cost because they're referring instead to the simplest possible mission, such as placing a satellite with its own propulsion system into the lowest viable LEO orbit. Another factor might be the introduction of rideshare, which is a program that small companies take advantage of that quotes prices as low as $6,000 per kilogram. For anyone who would like to learn more, there are a few subsections in the paper that discuss the discrepancy topic in more detail. You can find the paper online through this QR code. Also, there's a session coming up on Wednesday afternoon called Hype, Help or Hurt, that you might be interested in. To summarize, what the data on this chart suggests is that what NASA said back in 2012 probably still holds true today. Even in light of major monetary investments, the cost of launch has not decreased and in fact continues to increase. Let's talk next about the more outlandish idea of developing infrastructure to reduce the cost and increase the sustainability of space launch. There are several concepts in the literature that we would classify as space launch infrastructure. But today I'm going to talk about a specific one that we zeroed in on and developed a parametric model for. It's a mass driver installed at sea level and placed inside 
and evacuated too. At the end of the mass driver section, the vehicle coasts up a ramp, and then it travels for a short while through a suspended portion of the evacuated tube before exiting into the atmosphere. It is an air lock with fast doors at the end of the tube so that the vehicle can exit without letting much air in. As soon as the vehicle is in the atmosphere, it lights its rocket engine and uses that to accelerate the rest of the way to orbital velocity. So technically, this is a hybrid system, as it still uses the rocket to generate some of the necessary delta V. In this rendering, the vehicle is enlarged so you can see it more clearly, and time is sped up so that you can see the whole launch sequence in a reasonable amount of time. The mass driver we're using here is a twin variable pitch screw design. And this design, magnetic grapplers coupled couple to the screw plates, and the turning of the screws accelerates a launch sled down a central rail. This design avoids some of the scaling problems that other kinds of electromagnetic linear accelerators have with respect to rapidly switching electromagnets on and off. Electric motors are very efficient at converting electrical energy into kinetic energy. And because the Earth itself serves as the reaction mass here, the cost of operating the mass driver is on the order of $1 per kilogram for accelerating the payloads up to orbital velocity. And what this means is that the cost curve for a system is largely dominated by the capital cost of the system. Once you pay for the system, the cost per launch is incredibly low, as depicted by the orange line on this chart. Now, it's possible to sweep the model parameters to produce charts to illustrate how the technology scales. For example, we can ask the question, does accelerating along the ground really help? On this chart, the horizontal axis is the mass driver's exit speed, and the vertical axis is the delta V that's provided by the rocket. The four lines represent the altitude at the end of the suspended evacuated tube. So these, these lines represent 5,000, 6,000, 8,000, and 12,000 meters above sea level. As you can see from the graph, it doesn't really matter how high the tube is. The speed from the mass driver is basically transferred to the vehicle and not lost due to atmospheric friction. So the answer is yes. Despite the effects of atmospheric drag, it definitely does help to use a mass driver. In the paper, we also plotted mass fraction versus a variety of different designs. And we plotted the ratio of payload mass to rocket harbor mass versus a variety of different designs. You can see a somewhat exponential effect here on this graph. We also have a plot of the eyes out acceleration that you would experience upon exiting the evacuated tube as a function of the design parameters. So you can see that at the lowest altitude for the exit of the evacuated tube of 5,000 meters, and at the highest speed exiting from the tube, which is 7,000 meters per second, you get the maximum deceleration upon hitting the atmosphere. In this case, that deceleration is 100 meters per second squared, or about 10 Gs. And this is an acceleration that fighter pilots are trained to handle, and it's also a very brief deceleration. All right, to conclude, macroeconomically speaking, there are lots of very good reasons to have a positive outlook on the future of the space economy. However, you have to have a long-term horizon mindset, like that of a government or a public-private partnership, as opposed to the short-term mindset of a Silicon Valley startup. We do need to think more critically about the hype circulating on the internet concerning the rate of advancement of chemical rockets. It's more important for the industry to earn credibility because long-term investors such as government agencies need certainty and want to see credibility before they will invest for the long term. The work we did to model the variable pitch twin screw mass driver design leads us to believe that an infrastructure-based launch system is likely to be technically and economically feasible. It certainly seems like an idea that's easier to buy down risk on and more likely to be transformative for human civilization than, for example, fusion or quantum computing. I think that we should be doing far more research in this area, and I hope that some of you will agree that it's a way forward that shows a lot of promise, and that one day we might look back on the completion of the first space infrastructure project much in the same way that today 
We look back proudly on our ancestors who back in 1869 completed the Transcontinental Railroad. Hi, I hope you enjoyed that presentation. I want to let you know that if I learn of any errors in the material that I presented, I'll add an errata in the description below. So please check there to make sure that you're up to date. Also, the audio for the Q&A portion of the presentation wasn't so great. So I'll take a crack at answering the questions after in another video. One of the questions was about whether I knew of any reasons why launch assist wasn't technically or economically viable. And the other question was whether I knew of any terrestrial-based applications for a mass driver. If you have any questions or thoughts or comments, please mention them below. And until next time, stay real. Yeah, that was good. <laughs>